Welcome to what is probably the one of the more unusual Senate hearings of my career, a difficult hearing to be sure, and because in preparing for this morning's session, I've done a fair amount of reading. That in of itself is unusual for a senator. And a fair amount of thinking as well, which is a sort of an oxymoron, thinking senators. Um, my conclusion is that uh, grappling with this problem is going to be just about as easy as nailing jello to the wall. And if the scientists that we are going to hear from this morning are correct in their fears and predictions, the American Midwest, which I represent in the next century, at which time I will not be representing it, hopefully, may look like the Dust Bowl of my childhood. Indeed, things could be even worse. Because as one scientist after another has made clear, we are now conducting the ultimate environmental experiment with our atmosphere. Depending upon whom you ask, the consequences could be disaster of biblical proportions or just maybe nothing. Unfortunately, more and more of the bets are unbiblical and fewer and fewer on nothing. One of the frustrations of dealing with this issue is that it's virtually beyond the grasp of human imagination. Despite what the best scientific minds in the world tell us, our instinct, in this case, is to want to reject them out of hand. After all, common sense tells us that Chicken Little was wrong, the sky could never fall, and the ice caps could never melt, and yet it's true. What has precipitated this hearing is a rather extraordinary statement by a group of scientists from 29 nations. They met about two months ago in Austria under the auspices of the World Meteorological Organization the United Nations Environmental Program and the International Council of Scientific Unions. Many of the attendees were government scientists, others were from universities and research institutions. It was, as far as I can determine, a collection of the finest scientific minds in the world on this subject. And they all agreed on what they have never before been able or willing to say collectively. That is, that we can no longer assume the temperature of the world is stable. There have been previous Senate hearings on this subject. But the last of them was back in 1979, my first year in the United States Senate, my first year on the Governmental Affairs Committee, and my first impression uh, of the problem, thanks to Abe Ribicoff. Since then, we have learned a great deal. As I understand it, the level of confidence in the predictions of global warming is greater than ever before. Also, we have significantly increased our understanding of the possible consequences. Unfortunately, the progress in both of these areas is more likely to aggravate our fears than calm them. But we have also learned that there are solutions other than a freeze on industrial or technological progress. In 1979, solutions were generally limited to reducing or eliminating the burning of fossil fuels. Frankly, that is one of the burdens of the issue. It raises the specter of having to return to pre-industrial times in order to implement a solution. Our first witness is uh, our colleague, Senator Albert Gore from Tennessee. Al, thank you very much for being here. And your full well, statement will be made part of the record, as is your record of uh, commitment to dealing with these kinds of issues. Well, I appreciate your kind words, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Baucus, Senator Burdick. I appreciate your courtesy in allowing me to appear here as a, a witness this morning. And I'd like to congratulate uh, this subcommittee for its leadership in calling a hearing on this important issue, which has been too often ignored by policymakers in a position to address the problem. As uh, has been indicated already, it's of course a difficult issue to approach as a policymaker. And one of the simple reasons why is that uh, people in both the House and the Senate to respond, uh, we respond to uh, shorter term deadlines, generally speaking, uh, the next budget cycle uh, and, and the like, uh, and an issue that uh, forces us to look uh, into the next century and contemplate uh, consequences of a magnitude uh, far beyond those we're accustomed to dealing with is just uh, very difficult to, uh, to approach. But the fact remains that this period of history in which we're living is very different from any other in the history of mankind. Uh, modern man has acquired the ability through technology to catastro catastrophically modify the fragile atmosphere of our planet. Simply burning fossil fuels for warmth could uh, have the insidious long-term effect of warming the globe. 
the buildup of carbon dioxide as well as other trace gases traps radiation, causing uh, the well, now well-known uh, greenhouse effect. If today's worst scenarios become tomorrow's facts, we will then have only a few decades in which to ameliorate the impact, which could range from drought in the Midwest to floods in all coastal areas. For those unfamiliar with the greenhouse effect, it may sound more like a plot for a bad science fiction novel than a serious environmental issue deserving public policy review of the highest order. But given its serious and potentially drastic impacts, federal research and study efforts must place the greatest priorities on solving the mysteries surrounding the greenhouse effect. Otherwise, future generations may experience a science fiction story that comes true. My interest in the greenhouse effect goes back several years and includes three congressional hearings which I chaired in the other body. During the first hearing in 1981, a number of prominent scientists, including Roger Revelle of the University of California, testified that the greenhouse effect was not a theoretical entity, but very real. And I was struck at that hearing in 1981 that there was really no longer any dispute among the scientists in the relevant uh, fields of study that the phenomenon was real. I believe that uh, perhaps marked one of the first times that a consensus had, had emerged within the scientific community. And the evidence to substantiate the conclusion enunciated by Professor Revell was not long in coming. In 1982, James Hansen of NASA and George Kukla with Columbia University testified that the rise in carbon dioxide levels could be scientifically correlated very closely with a rise in the Earth's mean temperature, a shrinking of the polar ice caps, and the resulting rise in the Earth's mean sea level. At that time, the Washington Post, in an editorial, stated that the greenhouse effect was no longer just something for the sandals and granola crowd. It was in the mainstream of scientific thought. The most comprehensive evaluations of the greenhouse effect were presented at the third hearing in 1984. One was an EPA report predicting that there would be a global temperature increase of 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2040 and a rise of as much as 9 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100. This would result in sea level increases ranging from 4.5 to 7 feet by the end of the next century. And it's important to realize that the temperature increases would not be uniform all over the world. They're much higher at the, at the poles. And lower near the equator. Uh, consequently, the uh, melting phenomena uh, is uh, much greater than would be associated with a, an, an increase of only a few degrees at the poles. A few degrees worldwide translates into a much higher temperature increase at the poles. A report from the National Academy of Sciences was more conservative in its projections. The NAS predicted a 2 to 8 degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature, along with a modest what they described as modest, two and a half foot rise in sea levels by the year 2100. The major differences between the two studies was that EPA included the impact of greenhouse gases such as freon and methane, as well as carbon dioxide. The NAS projections, however, were based solely on increased CO2 concentrations. Since the release of those two studies, probably the most significant event to occur was the conference on the greenhouse effect that brought scientists from 29 countries to VLOC, Austria, this past October, to which you referred, Mr. Chairman. These scientists concluded that greenhouse gases are likely to be the most important cause of climate change over the next century. This conclusion was the basis for a recommendation that, quote, governments should take into account the results of this assessment in their policies on social and economic development environmental programs, and control of emissions of radiatively active gases. In the past few years, the scientific community has moved from uncertainty about the greenhouse effect to specific recommendations on how to address the issue. However, there are still disagreements as to the severity of the effect and the amount of time that we may have in order to ameliorate its impact. In order to decrease the scientific uncertainties and to provide more information for policymakers, I'm proposing legislation to expand and focus scientific efforts on the greenhouse effect and its consequences for society. The legislation would call for the establishment of an international year of scientific study of the greenhouse effect 
and would request that the President take steps to begin this worldwide cooperative investigation. This would be just the beginning. Many of the studies would need to continue for years. The legislation would, one, coordinate and promote domestic and international research efforts on both the scientific and policy aspects of this problem. Two, identify strategies to reduce the increase of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. Three, study ways to minimize the impact of the greenhouse effect. And four, establish long-term research plans. The concept of an international year of study has been used successfully in the past. In fact, ironically, the best and most complete collection of data based on atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide began in 1957 as a result of the International Geophysical Year. At that time, the sampling station at Mauna Loa, Hawaii was established, and today scientists are still collecting some of their most important data from that station. Now more than ever, we stand at the door of opportunity, wondering whether the door will close before we act to control the greenhouse effect, or whether that door will remain open long enough for us to establish a workable corrective policy.